All right. Well, we're in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 16, and this is kind of part two from last week, fallout from the, the fall. And uh, we, we saw Eve deceived. We saw Adam and his deliberate will choose to, uh, to sin against God. And then we saw the uh, ensuing then God coming to them as a loving father, uh, longing for them, looking for them, Adam and Eve, now recognizing that they had lost the holiness that they once had, uh, which was obviously uh, the way that they, uh, was the foundation for their relationship with the Lord. So they run from him, hide from him. He calls out to them and, uh, and then uh, points out the fact uh, of the obvious thing of their own sin and their own rebellion and how it uh, came about. Uh, Eve uh, uh, uses the excuse that it was she was deceived. Adam uses a more lame excuse and actually blames God for the sin because he says, it was the woman that you gave me, inferring that you brought this upon me and so forth. We know that Adam was passive in this whole thing. We pointed out the language that when the temptation is going on, Satan is speaking through the serpent in the plural to both of them at the same time. He's passive. He's there. He doesn't really take a stand for God for righteousness or anything else uh, and allows his wife to fall into this temptation. Therefore, he bears the, the brunt of the fact that uh, through one man, sin came into the world. And so it's, it all ends up falling on Adam's shoulders. Uh, and then, of course, God then deals with Satan. Uh, last week we saw that, and with that, the promise that a Messiah would come. It would be through the seed singular of the woman, the Messiah would come. Satan would attempt to, to uh, do some damage to him, but only bruise his heel but Satan in the process would have his head crushed. And of course, that is exactly what happened at the, at the cross. So that's kind of where we're, we're at to kind of catch us up to uh, our, our, uh, our passage this morning. And to point out one other thing, because uh, we've talked about the literary structure of Moses' writing when we kind of did our overview. Uh, and it becomes very obvious again here. Uh, Moses writes in a four-part structure, we said, first he deals with sin, and it's initially described. It's always in this pattern through this, this portion of Scripture. Then there's a speech, a speech by God announcing the penalty for sin. And then there's some grace that God interjects to the situation to try to mitigate the damage done by the sin. And we're going to see these things this morning. And then God basically dishes out the punishment for sin. Uh, and that's what we see here in verse 6. Uh, the temptation and the sin, God confronts the sinner. His speech is in verses 14 to 19, uh, uh, and he then deals with the snake, the woman, and then the man, and then the grace, which we'll talk about, and we just kind of mentioned this for that point, that we continue to see God's grace even in the midst of man bringing uh, sin into the world, and of course, then the judgment. In this case, that's in verse 22 to 24 as they are exiled from the garden, but we'll point out that even in that was, uh, was God's grace. Uh, what we're going to see is that um, God, God places upon woman in the punishment of her entering into sin something that would affect two incredible, important priorities of most women's life. That is her relationship in terms of birth and having children and her relationship with her husband. Both would be changed and altered as a result of the fall. And, uh, and for us, you know, again, First Peter, Peter tells us to husbands to live with your wives in an understanding way. We need to understand the dynamic and what happened at the fall. Because uh, otherwise, if we just take that, that Peter's saying, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Most guys are going to say, is that guy married? You know, because, because that's like an impossibility. But this is the dynamic here. This is the part that we can... Uh, that we can understand here. Uh, and it's uh, very, uh, very interesting, hopefully kind of sobering for us. And, and of course, then we'll go to the New Testament to see Paul and the New Testament writer's solution to this dilemma the gals are placed under. Then we're going to see that something uh, similar in terms of what would be very intrinsic and important por uh, priority to the guys. Well, we're in verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow 
and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. So Eve would have two critical priorities of her life affected. The first one in terms of having children. New Living kind of is more pointed uh, there in verse 16. I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. And uh, all the gals would say, well, I absolutely agree with the Bible on that point. Amen. That, that is absolutely the truth. Uh, I don't think you get any argument from any of the gals there. And, uh, and you have that as a result of sin in this world, as a result of sin coming into this world. It was not intended by God to be that way. It was not meant by God to be that way. And it's more than just the pregnancy. It's more than just the birth process. One writer says, her pain was not limited to the physical because pain here means painful toil and refers to the emotional as well as the physical. Uh, and if you've had children, raised children, you can know that sometimes your children are a pain. <laughs> and we're not just talking about the birth process. Uh, and that's the idea. It's uh, the thing that would be normally such a wonderful, joyful, important priority of a woman's life. And it can be. And it, and it may be. But still, there's an edge to it. There, it's a, it's a, it's a two-sided coin. Uh, it can be a, a time of, of great joy. And consider these parents, this couple, that raised their first two sons and one kills the other one. That's, that's kind of a tough one as a parent. That's a tough one. Uh, there's things, uh, we may never have to go through something as radical as that, but there's, there's something that enters the dynamic of the relationship, moms, that is a result of the fall. And it's just hard sometimes. And it's supposed to remind us that your fulfillment ultimately will never come through your life with your children. It will only come through a life with Jesus Christ. And you've got to be very careful to not take your kids and make them the idol and make them God. Because apparently moms are so nurturing and loving and so forth, it would be a natural tendency to put the kids before the Lord. That's the grace in this. God has set you up so that you'll have to constantly be driven to your knees and to a relationship with him. Uh, and he does that not only in terms of birth and children, but also secondly, uh, one of the priorities certainly would be normally a joyous marriage relationship. Notice your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. What does this really mean? Oh, you're just going to have this loving desire for your husband. It's just going to be so easy for you to just kind of submit to his authority. No, it's going to mean the opposite. You're going to have a desire to rule over your husband. Now, think of, Adam's the guy that's passive in this whole thing anyway. And a lot of guys are. Uh, and when they are, the gals have a natural thing to just kick in and rule and, and run the situation. Uh, and that's what's being spoken about here. If you go over a page to chapter 4, verse 7, we see the same two words and phrases used there. Speaking of the situation with Cain, temptation that he was facing, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. It's like a lion crouching at your door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And we could go through lots of passages, 15 or 16 of them, to show you that it means rule as in completely rule. And there's going to be an, a tendency, a natural tendency, gals, no show of hands, there's going to be a natural tendency in the marriage or relationship as a result of the fall for you to want to rule over your husband. And, uh, and there might be a tendency to... Uh, in some justification for doing it because he may be passive in a lot of decision making and the process that goes on in the context of marriage. And obviously it's something that you're going to have to guard against. Now, does this whole thought carry over in the New Testament? Sure. Every time the writers in the New Testament write about marriage, they make reference to this passage and the one we studied last week. They always take it back to Genesis because there would be those that would say, that, well, that's kind of archaic. That was in a very patriarchal uh, uh, type of social structure in those days. Our culture, our society is not like that. It's different today. Well, he doesn't make reference to a cultural reference. When Paul talks, when Peter talks about marriage, it's always back to Genesis, uh, back to what happened at the fall, back to God's original design. Keep in mind, why is it so hard? Because uh, in the beginning... 
God said, let us make man, mankind, in our image, in our likeness. Men and women were created both in the image of God. Let them rule over. Let them rule over. Co-equal, co-reigning in everything. And then that was lost. That's what God wired you to be and to do, and you don't get to do it now in the context of marriage. And if you try to do it, you're going against God, and you're going to cause some real destruction in your relationship in the relationship of your children who are watching your authority structure and whether you submit to God's word or not. And if you don't, there's a, good re there's a re real good reason they won't either. And they're watching and they're learning and seeing if we're following the authority structure God's given for the home. Ain't this a popular message? <laughs> it's just so interesting that, uh, you know, it's like anytime we hit this subject, I've got to do all kinds of gyrations and cover all these scriptures I'm getting ready to cover now to bring some balance to it because this goes so against everything else that we hear uh, in the world today. And because of that, because of the influence of the world, there is tremendous sin in the church in regards to this subject. And, and there's a lot of divorces that take place because we don't really understand God's instruction for marriage. Well, we could go to a lot of passages. I mentioned Peter talking about live in an understanding way. Paul deals with it in 1 Timothy as well. But kind of a classic is Ephesians 5, and I want to read certainly not the, uh, the whole portion of instructions of marriage, but a couple important passages. Ephesians 5, 22 to 26 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, notice, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their husbands in every way. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So it's the same thing. There's going to be a tendency in your heart. You're wired because of the fall to want to rule over your husband. How do you overcome that? By actually coming under and submitting to his, uh, his headship within, within the, uh, uh, the family, within the marriage. How are you to do that? As the Lord. What's the example? As the church does to Jesus Christ. As a believer, am I to submit to Jesus? Yes. And you're like most of the time, almost everything. You know, but Jesus doesn't really get it right all the time. So it's not like I'm going to always submit. You know, you just can't really. No, actually, we don't really say that, do we? No, we're, we're to always be submitting to his authority. And when we're not, it's because we're sinning. A wife is supposed to always be submitting to her husband. And when she's not, it's because she's sinning. And she's going against God's structure for the family. And she's, she's doing this as a result of the fall. Now, can guys make this easier or tougher for their wives? Well, they can make it easier or tougher. If they understand what's, what's so hard about this for, for a woman. Because she was never wired that way. She was never built that way. She was never designed that way by God. It's a result of the fall, and it's very, very difficult. So, so because of that, then the instructions for husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. How? He gave himself up for her. So in the way that Jesus, we would certainly say, died on the cross, so we would say this is a sacrificial kind of love. It's an unconditional love, and it's a love, if you look at the life of Jesus, that uh, was uh, that of a servant. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life is a ransom for many. So again, the idea of headship here means authority, uh, but it works both ways. The husband is to be, have an a unconditional love for his wife. He's to be the, the servant, in a sense, of the home of his wife uh, and family. And she is then to be submitted to his, uh, his authority. And I, th I think that if we've been around the Bible very long, we pretty much get those, get those concepts and everything. Uh, but there's some things here that are very important. Uh, headship does have limitations since Jesus is the model. Therefore, since it's God who gives the authority, then the headship and the authority in the home cannot command what God forbids. It can never forbid what God commands, and it can never be used selfishly. So those are important things for the guys to recognize. 
Authority brings responsibility. The husband needs the counsel of his wife, therefore, because he has tremendous responsibility in making decisions, and she's got lots of insights in areas of life in particular of relationships with other people that he needs to be able to listen and hear and weigh out and, uh, and so forth. He needs to be a man of prayer because, again, Peter says, if you don't live with your wife in this way, your prayers are going to be cut off, and, uh, and you're... you're you're, you're kind of in the deep kimchi at that point because you're trying to live this life with the Lord, but uh, your prayer life is going to be cut off and, and you're going to have real problems trying to live this thing out. The husband needs to be uh, in the word because he actually, if you follow the instructions further in the passage, like Jesus washes with the water of the word, the church, so he has a responsibility uh, in terms of his family and their spiritual well-being. What does submission not mean? Well, two things. It doesn't mean for the gals, it doesn't mean inequality. It doesn't mean that all women are to submit to all men. Jesus, again, is the example, and he submitted to the will of the Father. He said, I did not come to do my will, but the will of him who sent me and give my life as a ransom for many. And we can uh, read in, uh, in passages uh, like uh, John uh, 5.18 of the idea that Jesus was fully equal with God, and, and we know that. Uh, the idea that all women are submit to all men is not in the Bible. Galatians 3.27 or 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one uh, in Christ. We're all one. Uh, there's, there's no issue with gals out uh, being the authority in the workplace you know, in the educational system and so forth. This is talking about husbands and wives, husbands and wives only. So the idea of submission pertains to marriage. It is not an issue of equality. Uh, but look at the structure Paul gives us, again, to reiterate in 1 Corinthians eleven three. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman, and again, it's the term for wife, is man. And the head of Christ is God. So there is a structure that God gives in the home to try to help us combat what happened during the fall. Is it easy? No, it's a pain. Gals, is it a pain? It's a pain. Well, we're going to get to the guys here in a minute. There's something about their lives that's a pain also. But uh, again, it's a structure that God puts together. And that word uh, submission is actually the Greek word hupostasa, which is a military term. And if you've ever watched a military parade or if you've ever watched uh, or, or e at least talked to guys or gals that have been in the military and the structure of what they do when they go into combat, they are all hupastasso. They are arranged under in a structure, obeying that structure for the protection and the safety and the success of the mission. And if the gals, that's what you do. When you choose to go against what you're, what you're maybe feeling or is, uh, you're wired to do, and you choose to submit to your husband, even when you know he's wrong, because this is all unconditional, and when you choose to do that, you're aligning yourself in such a way so that your family will be protected and the success of your family can be enabled as you go forward. And when you choose not to do it, you open yourself up to the, the enemy. You can imagine some... <laughs> Some of our guys, like uh, Jake out there in Afghanistan today, leading his guys into battle, and, uh, and some of those guys, guys decide, uh, deciding, I don't think I want to follow him today. I think I'll go over here instead of over here. Uh, they're going to endanger themselves and everybody else, right? You, you just wouldn't do that. And yet we do that sometimes. Let me just read from a woman. <laughs> I want to quote Kay Arthur, who's a great Bible teacher. She says, when a woman submits, she needs to know that it's not to ensure her happiness, but rather it is to obey the Lord. The reason for submission to her husband is obedience to God, not to change her husband. Too frequently, if submission does not seem to reap results in a week or two, women want to quit, but submission is to be a continual, habitual way of life. It's an attitude of the heart. It's a matter of the will exercised as unto the Lord. And, uh, and I should have prefaced this by saying, I want to speak to the women here for a moment. So guys, could you all put your fingers in your ears here for a minute? Because this has nothing to do with you. Did I mention that this had nothing to do with you? It is not your position to get your wife to submit. 
How many know that doesn't work? It's like, I wouldn't even bring up the issue if I were you. This is a decision between her and the Lord. It's a decision between her and the Lord of her own free will to choose to do this in obedience to the Lord. Not because you deserve it, not because you should have it, uh, but because she believes that God's word is true and there's something driving her there to rule over. And the only way she can combat it is if she actually reverses the whole thing and chooses to come under the lordship. Uh, not the, we won't use that quite strong of a word, lordship. <laughs> but she chooses to come under the headship, uh, the servant leadership of her husband in the, in the home. But I, I, I want to get on to uh, later in this passage in Ephesians later in verse 31. There's two key elements that I think are, are critical that'll, that'll help us here. But again, uh, if the guys are unconditional, loving their wives in a sacrificial way, obviously it's going to make it a lot easier for the gals. If the gals are choosing to uh, submit to their husbands, it's going to make it a lot easier for him to carry out his role. And if neither of you are doing it, you're going to be clashing on a pretty regular basis, and it's going to impact not only you, but uh, if you've got kids, it'll impact your children as well. But uh, Paul goes on and says that marriage, in fact, is a picture of Christ in the church. Uh, and he describes that a little bit uh, and talks about how Christ is going to cleanse us and wash us and, uh, and so forth. And he says it's a profound mystery here when he's talking about these things, but I'm speaking of Christ in the church. And then he goes on and begins to quote, again, our passage from Genesis about the first marriage there in verse 30, 31. It says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. Okay, and then he throws in a very key line, verse 33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Two key things here. One is the fact that uh, the guys have to be told to love their wives. In fact, before this, Paul says, he who loves his wife loves himself. Uh, you're not doing yourself any favor by not unconditionally loving your wife. What does that mean exactly? That means speaking to her like she's your wife and not one of the guys. Here's what happens. Guys talk to their wives like they're guys. Hey, I said, hey, I said, get over here. Hey, are you doing? That doesn't really fly. That's not really how you talk to a, a woman. Uh, and if you, if you had a mother that taught you how to speak to women, you, you're, you're like blocks ahead of the, the next guy. But you have to learn how you speak is very important as well as how you act. The problem on the other end, as we get to in this passage, is that You've got guys that talk to their husbands like they're the oldest child in the family. Honey, I told you this, and I'm not telling you again. Because it, why? Because she's you know, working the kids all day, carrying out her responsibility, and, and putting them under her authority, and teaching them, and training them. He comes home, and he kind of just <laughs> he gets the same thing. And, uh, and Paul says, you can't do that, because husbands need to be respected. So as much as a wife needs unconditional love, the husband needs unconditional respect. And when that doesn't happen, what ensues is what run, one writer calls, I like, I like his phrase, the crazy cycle. The crazy cycle. Let me describe it. It's when you're arguing to two in the morning about who left the milk out. You know, big, big important stuff. <laughs> important stuff. When you find yourself arguing over stupid stuff, and sometimes you don't even remember what you're arguing over, you've entered the crazy cycle. <laughs> and here's how you get out of the crazy cycle. Because what happens is a husband will not speak and talk to his wife in a loving way. And so she will react to that by being very disrespectful to him. And then the man will do the honorable thing. The honorable thing, he'll clam up. Well, that's not honorable. I want him to talk to me. Doesn't he realize what's going? No, he'll do the honorable thing. That's what a man does if he does the honorable thing. He'll clam up. He'll quiet. And if it gets too much disrespectful, then he'll just leave. That's what an honorable man does. Because you don't want him to defend himself. Because he's used to defending himself among other guys. And it's not pretty. 
So he'll do the honorable thing and shut up. And then he'll walk. You go, well, I don't want him to do that. Okay, then don't be so disrespectful. But and then, then you're into the crazy cycle. He's quiet. He's saying nothing. And both things escalate. So how do you get out of the crazy cycle? Well, somebody's got to go first, of course. If the guy is being spoken to in a very disrespectful way, then no, then no, you probably have not been loving in the way you speak and the way you treat your wife. Just know that you've probably not been doing that. And so over the top, man, you've got to like pour it on. You've got to like over the top pour on that, uh, that love again. Gals, and I think here's the beauty, because I can tell you from just over the years and watching people's marriages and praying for people and stuff, is that it's usually the gal that becomes a little more attuned quickly to our marriage is falling apart. I mean, the guy's like, I got a good job. There's food in the refrigerator, paying the rent. I think we've got a good marriage. <laughs> I'm going to work every day. I mean, what, what could be... What else can I do here? I think we've got a good marriage. You know, and she's ready to, to leave, right? So usually the gal becomes a little uh, attuned a little earlier on than, than the guy. Uh, and so what you can do, gals, is then you can, because you're not being treated the way you want, you can start showing tremendous respect. Write it to them. Write a letter. Write a card. Tell them. Figure out the ways that you can respect him. It may not be a lot. Figure out something, some way that you can express your respect for him. Over the top, you'll break the crazy cycle. Again, who goes first? The one that is the most mature. That's it. Whoever's the most spiritual and mature is going to figure this thing out and go, we've got to break the crazy cycle. And they're going to choose, if it's the guy, to start, regardless of what's being said and how he's being treated, to start loving unconditionally over the top or it's going to be the wife that realizes this is really getting bad here and I don't want to keep being treated this way so I've got to react not in the way that I'm doing now but I've got to over the top begin to respect my husband yeah it's just a critical thing and um, and I can tell you you can you can break the crazy cycle and you can move on how is this all happening because of the fall because of the fall, because the gals were wired and built and designed by God to be co-equal, co-reigning in every way, and then that all changed. That all changed. And now, under the curse, that there's something now in her very nature that says, rule over him. And there's something in guys that will go, yeah, you're pretty good at that. Just kind of call the shots. You take it over, and I'm, I'm good with what's on Channel 9 tonight anyway. You know, and, and there's just this passive guy, dominating gal, and uh, it, it doesn't work. It falls into the world and the curse, and, and uh, they certainly, comedians have their, their day with it, and we say it's typical and all this stuff. It doesn't have to be that way. Again, it's follow the instructions, leave and cleave so that you can be one. We haven't lost that in the fall, but we've got some hurdles in the way. So Eve has two critical priorities in her life as a result of the fall. All women do. It has to do with childbearing, the delivery of the child, raising children, and then her husband himself. And the reason that God does this, where's the, you know, we've got the sin, we've got God's speech, where's the grace? We've talked about the punishment, where's the grace in this, is that this is supposed to drive you to your knees and to your relationship with the Lord. Uh, and anytime you put your husband or your kids before that relationship with the Lord, you're going to find out it's not as fulfilling as you really thought it would be. Because there's some things that we think of in our mind that we think this would fulfill me. If I had this this way, you know, it, then I will be totally... No, you won't. Only a relationship in Jesus Christ will bring that fulfillment Jesus says, come to me, all you who uh, labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And he's the only one that can. Well, let's look at the guys. Adam would have one essential purpose in his life effect, and that's in verse 17 and 19. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. 
In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So Adam is, is reminded of his failed purpose of leadership, which was, was to lead and be the spiritual head and so forth. But here he is, he's passive. He allows uh, Eve to be deceived. He doesn't stand up and say, don't listen to him. Don't question God's goodness. Yeah, we don't understand how this is going to work out, but God said, and we can, he doesn't do any of that. He just passively goes along with it. Uh, and we see him being reminded of that uh, here. His decision was willful. It was a choice. He was not deceived at all. Secondly, Adam would find a, a difficult dynamic in the essential purpose of providing for his, his family. So his punishment and uh, pain for him is the idea of going out there and, uh, and working every day. Now, work isn't a bad thing. Work is a good thing. And God made Adam to work. I mean, he was going to work, be working in the garden, and we talked about that. Uh, you know, he had responsibilities and so forth. Uh, it's a good thing. And certainly we, one of the things that the reformers got right was this idea, we even call it the Puritan work ethic, this idea that it doesn't matter what job you do, you can do it for the glory of God. It doesn't matter if you flip hamburgers at McDonald's or you're the vice president of IBM or whatever it is, whatever you do, you can do it with integrity uh, and you can do it in such a way to bring glory to God. Work is a good thing. Uh, and, uh, and it's intrinsic to the guy to provide for his family. And when you have the inability to do that, it's very hard. It's very difficult. It's tough on a guy's psyche because much of his identity, though it should be in Christ first, it's in what he does for a living uh, and, uh, and what job he has and so forth. Uh, but we got a problem because in that main thing that would normally drive guys along, God says going to kind of mess that up a little bit for you guys. I'm going to make it a pain. How many of you say going to work every day is like a pain? It's, work is a pain. You know, even if you like your job, you know, there's people there, you know, they're, sometimes they're a pain. You ever notice that? You know, I'd be fine. If, you know, it's just these customers that are driving me crazy. Even when I worked at Safeway, it's like every guy there wants to throw stock. Why? Because you don't want to be in that check stand all day. Because, man, people will drive you crazy. And uh, it's like, I'll do anything. You know, I'll, I'll clean the back room. You know, I'll, I'll restack the pallets 12 feet high out in, the, out in the hot sun. Anything. Just don't put me in the check stand because uh, that's where people are. And uh, we're, we're just so, uh, you know, work is a pain. And, and God meant it to be a pain. Notice that uh, uh, the thorns and the thistles and so forth. The earth becomes the enemy. And again, not work itself, but God makes it difficult for us. And the things that he makes difficult is the very thing that we would normally just totally uh, entrench ourselves into, in a sense. And guys can do that. The work, the job, the career becomes the idol. And God says, I'm so afraid of you doing that, I'm going to make it a pain. So you realize that. No matter what it is you're doing or what you think you might do in the future, it will never ultimately bring fulfillment in your life. And the only thing that will is a relationship uh, in Jesus Christ. The work is good. The problem is it's covered with thorns. But we live under this deception that, uh, that uh, if I had the right job, it would be better. Do you want me to tell you what guys think about all day at work? A better job. That's what they think about all day. If I had that guy's job, or if I had this job, or if I had been in this career, you know, and you think all day, you can't stand what you're doing, so you figure out, you know, how it's, how it's going to be, you know. Uh, it's, we're looking for that better job. Well, there was a guy in the Bible writing that, that had it all, but still wasn't locking with the Lord. But he thought if he could have all the power, all the money, everything else around him, tremendous intellect, if he could have all those things, then he would be fulfilled in life, and God let him have it. He let him have all those things. His name was Solomon. And he writes a book in the Bible that expresses a, a worldview apart from a faith and trust in, uh, in God. If you want to know what secular people believe and think and what their worldview is, we've got it in the Bible. It's called Ecclesiastes. And this is what Solomon wrote, who was in his day, kind of one of the smartest guys in the world, in his day, probably the most powerful guy in the world. 
in his day, one of the wealthiest guys in the world. So if you're thinking, if I had one of those things, I'd be good, uh, you wouldn't. That's the, that's the whole thing. Uh, did I throw in the thousand wives? That didn't really work out anyway either. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 2.10, this is what this guy says. It's got all that stuff. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity, and a grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Somehow his life was a waste of time. That's what he's saying. He's saying life is a waste of time. I don't care what you've got or what you do for a living or how successful you are. God made it that way. <laughs> God made it that way for us guys. It takes us a while to figure it out sometimes. It takes us a while. Because the illusion is if we had the better job, if we made that much more, if we had, you know, we, we keep up in the ante as the years go by, that somehow it would be fulfilling. There was a, uh, got to hear a great testimony. It was so long ago, it was actually on cassette tape. And uh, if you're younger, we'll explain what that is later. But uh, uh, it was at a men's conference that was at the Anaheim Convention Center that Chuck, Pastor Chuck, does every, every year. And Lane had heard it and gave it to him. Remember the guy that was the test pilot? This guy was in his 70s, uh, and he was a uh, test pilot for, the, for, the, for Boeing. And, uh, and now we know that he was the lead test. He couldn't say at the time. He was the lead test pilot for the F-22, this guy in his 70s. He says, I love it when all the young captains and lieutenants would come out and I'd take them a ride and make them all throw up several times. <laughs> Guy in his 70s. But he, he shared his testimony, his whole career, about how he, <laughs> his dad was uh, uh, out in Orange County when they were, used to give away land out there. And his dad was, uh, got some little property, was building his house and needed to put a roof on it. So uh, his, his mom uh, took the girls. He was there with his dad. He was like five years old. Dad was putting a roof on the house. I don't know how this would fly these days. So his dad didn't really want him to fall off the roof. So he just took a, a big nail, took the back of his pants, and, and nailed him to the roof. <laughs> so he wouldn't slide off and uh, left him up there while he was, you know, laying shingles. And it was in the flight path of, uh, of a local airport near, nearby. I don't know if it was John Wayne or not. So that's what he did, like for a week, all day, as his dad was doing the roof. Watch those planes at that that's, that's what I want to do. And he says, and I've done the ultimate. And this guy was a stunt flyer, military pilot, then later test pilot. And, uh, and he flew the ultimate aircraft. And he says, and he, he described a scene being in that plane, knowing that it was that fifth generation. This is like an alien spacecraft <laughs> to what he's flying here. Uh, and he's up there, and the sun is just coming up, and he's breaking through the clouds. And he says... There was a day when I thought this would be the ultimate fulfillment. He says, on this stage there in Anaheim Convention Center, but I can tell you, it's not. As glorious as it is, the only thing that brings real fulfillment, I don't care what your career is, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't wait till you're my age to figure that out. But there's this illusion that somehow, for the guys, that's going to do it. And it's never going to do it because of the fall. Let's go on. Adam and Eve, and I'll try to cover these... Uh, these uh, quickly, Adam and Eve will find uh, hope in God's promise and provision. That's in verse 20, 21. And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So uh, Adam finds hope in God's promise. There's a, it's a prophetic hope. Uh, very interesting. He names his wife. Uh, uh, Eve means life or life giver. And uh, apparently Adam had listened very closely to God's speech uh, and heard what he said in that promise in verse 15 that it's going to be through her. She's going to have a child, and that child is going to crush the head of Satan who brought all this on us. And he says, had they had a lot of kids yet? Had anybody had any kids yet? No. So this is kind of a little faith involved here. He's like, yeah, so he's going to have a kid. What's the big deal? No, there hadn't been any kids but he believes what God says and says she's going to have a child, so I'm going to name her the life giver. She's the one that's going to bring life. As we continue in the story, they're thinking the first kid she has is going to be the Messiah. <laughs> they're looking for this, this first one. They're believing God's word uh, at this point. 
So even in the way that he names her, he's at this point is believing uh, and trusting God's word. Very, uh, very important uh, declaration. And we might say that it's a, a shout of, of hope. The second thing about uh, Adam and Eve, they would find hope in God's provision. In verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Uh, and so, uh, again, this is the, uh, the obvious Moses writing to his readers out there in the Sinai desert, understanding the Levitical priesthood. Clearly, they're having to go to sacrifice an animal, lay their hands on the head of that lamb or that goat, and confess their sins, have that priest slit its throat and have its blood poured out. They understand the concept that sin is really bad and sin is really evil. And the price that gets paid for it is very radical and, uh, and is very sobering. And when they read this of Adam and Eve, they go, oh, it was the same for them, wasn't it? Because Adam and Eve would have never, you know, what did they do? They hide from God and they grab some fig leaves <laughs> and kind of throw them together. That in their mind, they would have never conceived of killing an animal. It just wasn't done. Kind of like all friends here. We're all like vegans hanging out together. But the idea of, I'll just kill one of my little friends here, so I've got a new coat. It, it, it just it did, would not have come into their thinking. Uh, Marcus Dodds, who was a, a great, brilliant uh, 19th century Scottish preacher, says this. He says, Adam took leaves, <coughs> took leaves from an inanimate, unfeeling tree. God deprived an animal of life that the shame of his creature might be relieved. This was the last thing Adam would have thought of doing. To us, life is cheap and death is familiar. But Adam recognized death as the punishment of sin. Death was to early man a sign of God's anger. And he had to learn that sin could be covered not by a bunch of leaves snatched from a bush as he passed by, but only by pain and blood. Sin cannot be atoned for by any mechanical action, nor without expenditure of feeling. Suffering must ever follow wrongdoing. From the first sin to the last, the track of the sinner is marked with blood. It was made apparent that sin was a real and deep evil, and that by no easy and cheap process could the sinner be restored. So the foundation was laid. This is how sin is going to be dealt with. Without this, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. They grab a bunch of leaves. God says, what you did and what happened is a lot more serious than that. And, uh, and they begin to learn how serious sin is. Now, Paul then says, he closed them there. Paul says in, in Galatians 3.27 that we, by faith in the new covenant, what Jesus did for us on the cross, are now clothed in Christ. And then Revelation 19, John puts it this way, speaking of the church, the bride of Christ. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And, uh, and so we see this process by which God would, again, lay the foundation and follow it through in the Levi Levitical priesthood. And finally, with Jesus on the cross, sin would be dealt with, but it would be a radical price. Adam and Eve find uh, grace in being prevented from entering the garden. Verse 20 to 24, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the garden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So Adam and Eve, the promise of Satan didn't really work out well for them, you know, and that uh, it seldom does. Uh, yeah, they knew the difference between good and evil. No, the God thing didn't really work out. It wasn't quite as glorious as they, as they thought. Uh, important to, to remember that is the tempter comes to us. Ken Hughes says Adam and Eve's bodies were alive, but they were dead. Remember, they died spiritually. As residents of the garden, they could have eaten from the tree of life and perpetuated their bodily existence indefinitely. Thus, the garden would have become hell on earth, populated with the undying dead, forever living and forever dead. And God, in his grace, was not going to allow that to happen. You're going to go out. We're going to keep you away from the tree of life. 
so that you can choose to place your faith in that seed, the Messiah that would come, so that you could follow as he would give them instructions on how to have a relationship with him, uh, and they could continue in faith waiting for that Messiah to come. They would then physically die so that one day through the death of Jesus and his shed blood, they might rise again and be resurrected. It was his grace that took them out of, out of the garden. And it was his grace that prevented them from, uh, from ever entering them again. Notice the cherubim is sta stationed there on the east side of the garden, the flaming sword, which speaks of God's justice and his holiness. Uh, and again, things changed in terms of man and his relationship with God. Before the garden, we would say, would be the holy of holies of the earth where God in his presence dwelt in a special way. Later then, there would be the tabernacle, which would be God's holy of holies, where God's visible presence dwelt in a special uh, way as again. Uh, both of them, uh, again, featured cherubim. Uh, we see that, those you know, emphasis of the cherubim guarding things in the tabernacle as well. It's two cherubim that are over the mercy seat and the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, in the same way, God's provision for garments for Adam and Eve to cover their sin. When a priest would enter, he would have to also put on special types of garments. But all of this, God then brings back to us as he, through Jesus, clothed us with uh, uh, the garments of linen, speaking of the holiness that he's provided for us. And he's the one that's given us this incredible access to God that we can pretty much take for granted, can't we? You know, David talked about how great it is to come in and worship the Lord. We get to do that not because of the fall, but because of the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, it's the access that they were shut out from. Uh, it's the access that we now get to enter because of what Jesus did. What was lost in the garden becomes gained in Jesus Christ. So instructions for us. We live in a fallen world, and because of that, Sorry, gals, you got, you got a couple things going, going against you there that are going to make life a pain at times, including us guys. For us guys, it's, uh, it's just, you know, that, that drive. And there's a tremendous drive to be out there and providing for, for our families. Uh, it's it's critical and critically important to most guys in terms of their identity and the, who they are, the ability to do that. It's super important. That's why when we talk to each other, hey, how you doing? Hey, it's nice to meet you. So what do you do? You know, that's what we say. We might get to sports teams after that, you know. It's like the gals get together, and, it, and it's like they've talked for five minutes, and they know how many kids and the names and the birth dates, and, you know, just, the details are amazing, you know. But us, it's what do you do? This identity. But it's hard, and it's a pain at times. And God meant it to be for all of us so that we would be driven to a relationship in Jesus Christ and because he's the only one that invites us to come to him, you who are weary and laden, and I will give you rest. And fulfillment in life, you just won't find it some other way. The illusion of the world is that you will, but it'll never happen. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that, uh, that even in uh, the judgment of sin, your grace is there. Lord, help us to uh, see it. Help us to realign our, our priorities to put you first uh, in our life. It's easy to get off track, off course, Lord, and sometimes we need to, to just get reset again and recalibrate, Lord, so that we're putting you first, and Lord, because that's where the ultimate life and, uh, and real living comes from. So, Lord, we pray that you'd help us do that. Pray for the, the, the gals that are married here, Lord, that your grace would be upon them. Help them do what is very hard for them to do because of the fall. Lord, and we pray for the guys that we would not be passive like Adam was and allow our families to fall into temptation and be ravished by uh, the enemy that is still out there alive and active. Lord, that we'd be men of prayer, men of your word, uh, and be able to be the spiritual heads of our homes. And Lord, uh, we, you just know that we, we need each other, Lord, in the context of marriage, but we need to have you first. Help us to do that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before